Uh, that's where I was getting right next to. Okay, so no objections on quiz next Friday. I don't know what the date is. 26? Okay, so that'll be our next quiz. What to watch for. So you do have a study guide up. You know I always use these breaks to try to kind of jump things up in case people want to work ahead. So um, what to watch for, probably our next homework and our next study guide going up as well. Um, and again, I, don't, I just don't like having things right when we get back. I just think that that doesn't give you the opportunity to work with your classmates or seek help. So I'll probably lean towards next Friday as well for the next homework. It won't be Wednesday when we come back. Um, and then, you know, again, I'd like to try to do three more. One, two, three. We'll see. That's going to get really tight. So if I start writing this homework and I'm like, oh, God, we just haven't learned enough. Oh uh, yeah, maybe we have to bump it back and I only get two more in. But I'd, I'd like to do three more because then that gives us 11 and then I drop one so I have 10 and I have a perfectly easy number to calculate. 10 homeworks at 10 points each. I have 100 points for homework. Um, so that would be kind of why I would like it. Also, you know, let's just kind of get past me and my, my selfishness of liking easy math. Um, I actually kind of think if we could squeeze in an extra homework or so in this production modeling, it might be beneficial for you guys in terms of of preparing for the exam just because this stuff's kind of tougher and uh, I, I would re much rather us lose points you know on a homework you miss two or three points on a homework that doesn't even matter that just gets washed out then you miss a problem on a test so to me I, I would always lean towards more practice um, if it's possible so that's kind of what I'm going to try to mentally do is write it and think about can this be something we would have to do next Friday just so again, it gives us that at least chance of getting that extra assignment in for more practice. So that's what I think we've got coming up. We're still in chapter six. We'll be in chapter six all day today. Um, and I would kind of expect still probably in chapter six on the day when we get back too. So, um, so that's still where we are in reading five, six is, is where you want to be. Okay, so any other things before we jump in? Okay, so what did we do last time? We were working with our solo model, and we kind of gotten to that point where we zoomed in to the, well, the under the output function, if you will, to where I had my depreciation function, my investment function, right? Savings as a function of capital, which is our investment in the model. We had some... KPW, we found this point, and at the very end, we called it KSS. We said, eh, we still don't know exactly what we're doing with this axis up here yet. Uh, so I just said, what do we got on the graph? Well, we've got investment and depreciation. So I just kind of chucked that up there for now. And yeah, we won't have a great fully labeled function for that for a, for a little bit. So, And then... Then we started kind of talking about what it meant to be in different spots on this graph relative to KSS. And we kind of talked about that delta K uh, value and how it's, well, positive at this point and negative at, at this area, you know, those areas in the graph. And, um, and kind of maybe thinking about what that means for each different production value. And so that's one thing that we kind of put on hold and we wanted to think about, because then we kind of strayed into the math of this point, which was fine. And we came up with, you know, our formulas that we had where delta K effectively was the difference in, you know, I minus DK, investment depreciation. And we said, well, I is represented by SFK minus DK. And then we said at KSS, I know I'm skipping some steps because we went through them. We went through the steps last time. That KSS, SFK equals DK. So, you know, we kind of had some, some math that we were leading into, and that end of the math, or the end of class last time, was kind of our preview of the math to come. So, we want to kind of think about, you know, again, where does this equation have its basis in? And in order to do that, we, we need to see the actual mathematical theory behind it. And then we'll kind of put in a little work, and then we'll fall back to, yes, we like this equation. Um, so, um, so to kind of 
set that up, well, we need to do a little bit of proof. <coughs> so Solo, uh, you know, the guy who the model's named for, Robert Solo, looked at all of this mathematically, and we're still going to make some assumptions. You know, we're still going to assume Cobb Douglas. And for right now, I'll address it in, you know, at the end. But for right now, I want to do a simplification assumption. I want to assume that my alpha parameter is equal to 0 0.5. My alpha parameter is equal to, so if you see alpha parameter, in, that, that's just all that means. Now, if you think about that, we've talked about that in terms of, well, let's relate this to a Cobb-Douglas. Um, I'm going to say that, and then, that, you know, k to the alpha l to the 1 minus alpha um, effectively just rewrites it as y is equal to k to the 0.5 l to the 0.5 practicality in real life probably a really bad assumption I'm really just normalizing everything I'm making the effect of, on GDP equal from capital to labor data showed that's not true, that, that, that our labor is far more valuable. Um, practicality, bad. Application for our class. Hey, this is one of those great pluses of using the crappy business school provided calculators. They cannot do real life ones. I can't put in, you know, 0.25 and 0.75. They don't do it. But we can do 0.5 and 0.5 because they're square roots. So this is a plus for the test. On the exam, this assumption is perfect. It's a simple assumption, and it's going to make our proof easier and our solve easier. It's not realistic in real life. However, using realistic values doesn't change the proof. It just makes the math more difficult and more difficult than our basic four function calculators can do. So on the exam, this proof is perfect. On the homework, yeah, I'll probably throw a tougher one on there. We'll see what we can do, but we'll, at the end of the proof, I'll address what if it changed, you know, more realistic. Okay, so that's going to be our starting assumption, right? We know that everything, so here, there's where we start with. We know, I just turned that into one word for some reason. We know that everything in Solo is measured at a per worker basis. Not true in Cobb Douglas. <coughs> so that means I have to make that adjustment. I have to take my Cobb Douglas function and make it per worker. Well, I can, I can do that pretty easily. I can go and say, well, um, y over l would be my output per worker. What I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other. So I can take my k to the 0.5, l to the 0.5, and put it over l. As soon as we have our per worker values, so like I have output per worker, I'm just going to kind of draw this right over here. I'm just going to call this y star. The star is effectively my assumption that it's a per worker function. The textbook gets a little bit more formal, mathy with it. It starts looking at capital and lowercase Greek letters. Um, yeah, that that kind of gets annoying. But whenever you see like an uppercase kappa, well, that's referring to K star. That's okay. So I'm just going to call it Y star, um, <coughs> partly because I think it's easier and partly because I can't draw all the Greek letters. So it works. So we can now rewrite this effectively as y star equals k to the 0.5, l to the 0.5, over l to the 1, l to the first. All right, I kind of got this y star taken care of. I want to think about this side over here. Algebraically, this is the same as writing k to the 0.5, l to the 0.5, l to the negative 1. Right, because I can take whatever I have on the bottom of my fraction, 
and bring it up by effectively switching that, that power. Okay, now we have a calculus rule. I have terms that are multiplied that are the same variable. I have an L and an L multiplied by each other. They each have a power right up here. Our rules of exponents say that if we multiply our terms, you can add your powers. So effectively, this becomes k to the point 5, L to the point 0.5 minus 1, or to the negative 0.5. OK, again, rules of calculus. Effectively, I'm just going to use the same rule I had up here. Rules of calculus. I have a power that's negative. If I have a power that's negative, I can use the reciprocal rule in exponents and calculus and put this at the bottom of my fraction, which means I can write it as k to the 0.5 over l to the 0.5. Those are all identical functions. All right, we have another exponent rule here. I have two different variables that are divided that have the same exponent value. So we have another exponential rule that says we can pull that exponential value out to represent the entire divisor function. Meaning I can say this is equal to k over l, the entirety of that divisor, to the 0.5. So I've got, uh, well, I've got, again, this kind of nice algebraic track that has got me now a per worker variable. Again, the textbook uses kappa, uppercase kappa per worker, which is a K with like a fancy middle. I'm just going to use K star. So I'm just going to call this K star as effectively a measure of of capital per worker, all of this to the 0.5. Now this is good because this is going to help us in our solo model because in order to make that transition from a Cobb-Douglas utilization that we're using that is not per worker, I now can solve for values for k that would be on the capital per, per worker axes, which is important because, well, that's what I have. So we now can kind of combine what we've seen here, and we can say that y star is equal to k star to the 0.5. Or if we just assume We just assume all of our values are stars per worker. In solo, <coughs> y is equal to the square root of k. Again, that's effectively saying y star is equal to the square root of k star. This, this is big. We'll box it, star it, highlight it whatever we're going to do with this, because this is an assumption that is crucial for our test. Because again, our test has to have an alpha parameter of 0.5. Our calculators can't handle it otherwise. What if we did it though? What if it was a real world value? Actually, it doesn't really matter. The proof works the same way. I'm just going to go through it really quick, and you can just wait and see the end result, and that will be totally fine. Um, what if we had a more realistic parameter of alpha equals 0 0.3? OK, well, if we set up our Cobb-Douglas equ equation, we would have y equals k to the 0.3, l to the 0.7. And we would handle this the exact same way, y star is equal to 
k to the point 3, l to the point 7, l to the negative 1. Handle it the exact same way. Two l's here, I have point 0.7 minus 1 gives me k to the point 3 over l to the point 3. Factor it all out, and I get k over l to the point 3. So you'll notice that in solo, I'm going to give you the normal approach for it and then the, oh yeah. In solo, our alpha parameter dictates what solo calls the theta term. Effectively, y star is always equal to k to the theta. Or effectively, in this case, you know, again, we assume everything is stars. <laughs> if our theta is 0 0.3, our alpha is 0 0.3, our theta is going to be 0 0.3. So effectively, in solo for realistic purposes, you know, in this case, you know, So it, it, it doesn't, the, the proof doesn't change if we use more realistic values. It's still going to walk through the same way. Our alpha parameter becomes our per worker theta parameter. So it doesn't change anything. So again, you don't have to, you can write down the end result right here. And it, it gets you square for the homework. You don't have to redo the whole proof. And that's why I kind of sped through it. Okay. Any questions on the proof? I know proofs are obnoxious. We gotta actually use it. Proof is useless in real life. Let's do something with it. So questions before I do a board clear. Okay. I'll uh, keep all that. And I'll keep that, I'll just move that up over here in a minute. So, <coughs> I'm just going to put this in things we know. Y equals square root K, right? Okay. So now, we want to use it. So let's make a little bit in terms of some assumptions. So let's assume all of our kind of same initial stuff, a Cobb-Douglas function, an alpha parameter of 0.5, so I can use y is equal to the square root of k. Let's say that our initial capital level in society is equal to 4. Let's say that society saves Thirty percent of their income. Which would mean they spend seventy percent of their income. Um, let's give a depreciation, let's do an easy number. Let's say that the depreciation value is equal to 10%. So 10% of our capital depreciates each production period or each measure of time. Okay, so we can kind of think about this in terms of a parameter really quick with our equations um, because we actually have a value in terms of measuring savings, we have a savings function. Which means given the savings function, SFK, and the knowledge that we have a value, um, I'm going to put this up here, for Y being equal to FK, it's on our graph from last time. 
we effectively can think of savings as any rate S as a decimal times Y, or effectively point S Y gives us the value for investment. By the way, we could, you know, look at this in terms of consumption as well. We could say consumption as a percent, um, you know, point C times Y gives us consumption. Okay, so we have kind of all of these parameters out. I have an initial capital of four units per worker at, at whatever our, again, our starting production period in our, our model is. I want to know what happens as we approach the steady state. Effectively, I want to know where I am on my graph. Well, I can determine that given the information that I know. So to help us kind of in setting this up, because I thought it would take a long time to write this chart in your notes, I went ahead and just kind of pre printed out a little bit of a chart for us to start with. I did a little half sheets to save. So Alicia, Ivana, I probably did more in this two rows. So whenever it gets, just start passing it back. And... So let's take a look at this chart. You'll see I have production period one. I have my K star value. Okay, this is my initial capital at our initial level of production. I need to find the rest of the values. Well, what do I know about Y star? Right here. Y is equal to the square root of K. So if K is four, Y is the square root of four. That should be a pretty easy one. Next, I have consumption investment. There's two ways to find this. We can find it using my formulas based on SFK. We also can find it because we know in the solo model Y is equal to C plus I. So you have a kind of a double check. It should work out both ways within some measure of rounding. Um, measure of rounding, I would go maybe three or four. I know we always like two decimals, but I, a lot of times these solo ones, they're going to get out to a couple of decimal places before we start seeing um, some significant change in the model. So maybe three or four digits here. So let's start out with C, because well, that's what I have first. Point C times Y. 70% would be point 0.7 Y equals C. Or, well, we solve for Y, point 0.7 times 2 equals C. We should be able to utilize the same information for I. So I'll let you go ahead and find I. Then we have our depreciation. You can see the actual, the, the computer lets me type in some of the letters. That's the actual Greek abbreviation for depreciation. I call that a lowercase d. So then we have our value for depreciation. We know that capital depreciates at 10% per period. If we started with four units of capital, it's effectively saying that we are going to wear out 10% of those four units, which is, well, depreciation, we said, think about it. Remember, this was last class. We said DK 
Think about this as a rate, as a percent. So 0.1 times k, 0.1 times 4, gives me 0.4. Delta k. I have a formula for delta k. It means it's solvable. My value for i minus my value for dk. What do we get? <coughs> Who's got it, Doug? Yeah, what do we get for delta k? Point two. That tells me something. First of all, it tells me that we are not at the steady state. Why are we not at the steady state? Why? Why are we not at the steady state? Because it's, <coughs> it's not zero. We know at the steady state delta k is equal to zero. We also know something else now. We, we know where we are in our model. We know we're not at the steady state. We also know where we are. We are somewhere over on this side. We are to the left of the steady state. And I know that because, well, delta k is positive. OK, so now what? Well, that completes our first production period, right? So we need to go to our second production period. And you'll notice I didn't give us a k-star value. But we can solve for a k-star value, just like I did last class with my markers. Right? I said that I had uh, you know, four markers. Some of them wore out. But because delta k was positive, I had enough money to buy, replace all the ones that wore out, and I added an extra marker. Delta K is showing me how much I add, or down here, subtract, to capital. So if I started with four units of capital after my whole first round of production, I lost 0.4, but I had enough money saved to replace all those 0.4 and buy 0.2 more units. I started with 0.4, I added 0.2 additional units, I have a starting K star value now of 4.2. So for each new production period, K star is equal to K star one prior plus or minus delta k. That is, uh, wow, that is super math talk. It, it, it's scary math talk, honestly, for take the k star and the line right above. Add or subtract, because it could be <coughs> negative, the delta k, and the, the, then you get it. So don't let the math formula scare you. It's something that you can do. Which means now we have the capability of solving out row two. All right, so work through row two. See where that gets us. Again, like I said, I, I kind of like four decimals because I think you need it. So take a minute, solve out row two. We use all the exact same strategy.
Okay, we get it? Oh, Miss Work ahead. So what do we see? Still not at the steady state. <coughs> 0 0.1940. Eight. Told you guys to do four. I did it in mine and got one nine five, so you messed it up for me. Point one nine four eight. Still not at the steady state. It does give us some indication, again, that we probably you know, kind of have four in the right spot because if this distance between the two functions effectively represents our value of delta k, you'll notice that it got smaller, which means we're getting closer to the steady state because you'll notice that delta k, that distance between the two, gets smaller the closer you get to the steady state but we still didn't get there, which means we would have to, well, do another production period. Production period three. I'm going to speed this up because I don't want you just to sit there and do this. So here's what we have for production period three. Here's what I got. Your starting K now would be utilizing this formula. Well, what was my K in the time prior? Plus or minus delta K. So I did 4.395. For my y, I got 2.096. For my c, I got 1.467. For my i, I got 0 0.6. Oh, I lost it on my chart here. 629. For my dk, I got 0 0.44. And for my delta k. 0 0.189 <coughs> still doesn't get me to the steady state. So about this time, I got sick of doing it by hand and said, I'm going to put this into Excel. So I made an Excel growth model with these same equations. And uh, I started fast forwarding. Let's fast forward to, uh, well, production period 25. If you were to do this 25 times, your K star will be 7.321. All right, let's see what that gets us. So just jump ahead. Go to production period 25.
right? So again, let's speed this up a little bit, right? So here's what we got for Y, 2.7057. C, 1.89, Four zero. I, 0 0.8117. DK, 0 0.7321. And delta K, 0 0.0796. We're still not at the steady state, but we, we're learning something. So again, we know we, where we are. We're getting really close to the steady state. And we're now out 25 production periods and we didn't move much, guys. We didn't move very much, right? We're kind of like, you know, going from here to here to here in 25 production periods. This actually tells us something. Uh, it might, it's not a definition, it's gonna sound like one, it might behoove you to write it. As you approach the steady state, Adding more and more capital stock has less <coughs> impact on growth. As you approach the steady state, adding more and more and more capital stock has less impact on growth. Growth is still gonna go up because we are still adding extra capital. Our, cap, our capital in the next round, K star, is gonna be bigger, which means people have more tools, we can produce more stuff. But every time, as we're getting closer and closer and closer to that steady state, it's not going up by as much. So as I approach that steady state, well, I still see an increase in output, but at that diminishing rate. Honestly, just kind of like what we expected, what our past data showed, we now see that we should be able to apply to future data. Okay, so, um, so let's fast forward again. I did 25 lines, we didn't get there. I did 100 lines, we didn't get there. Technically, in theory, this point effectively becomes like an asymptote. We can get closer and 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 closer. Which means that I actually, on this, I had to go out 744 lines in Excel and 13 decimal places before I got zero, before I was truly at the steady state. And, um, well, was I exactly? No, because I could have made it bigger. I could have gone 17 decimal places, and I wouldn't still have quite been at zero. But you know what was happening right around line oh, 650? It was 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99. Then if I went out 13 decimals, 8.9999914, 8.9999937, you know, 8.999, yeah. On line 744 is where Excel just said, screw it. It's nine. So let's see what happens in nine. This one will go quick, man. You could do these square roots quick, right? Oh. Square root of nine is three. <coughs> Perfect. Three times 0. 0.7, 2.1. Three times 0.3, 0. 0.9. Double check, 2.1, 0. 0.9. Do they combine to three? Yep. So y is equal to c plus i. Depreciation, 10% of 3 is 0 0.3. I'm sorry, 10% of 9 is 0.9, my bad. 10% of 9 is 0.9. I minus DK, 0. Yeah, finally. Like I said, 744 times. 
less if we kept our parameters to point four decimals, but even still you're hundreds of times. So now we go back to last class. And we say, okay, we've done all this proof. We've talked about moving all around through here. I don't want to do this equation 744 times. But we know that SFK is equal to DK. And given this knowledge, we can solve out this value using our math proof, if you will. SFK is equal to DK. So, okay, well, let's do it. Okay, so S we know. S was 0.3. FK we know is Y. So we were able to just take it times 0.3 times our y value. We don't know why our y value. That's okay. We also know that y is equal to the square root of k, which means that if we use the transitive property right here, we know that fk equals square root of k. So I can rewrite this as 0.3 times the square root of k is equal to d. We talked about d, 0.1, we know it's written as a, pers a, a, a decimal, 0.1 k. Which means now, if I wanted just to kind of, I want to solve for k, right? That's what we're trying to get, k. So I need to get all the numbers on one side and all the variables on the other. Well, I would divide by 0.1, divide by 0.1. So now I have, um, 0.3 over 0.1 square root of k equals k. Uh, well, we still want to get rid of that. So why don't I uh, multiply each side by 1 over the square root of k? That would cancel it out up here. So I'm left with 0.3 over 0.1 equals k over the square root of k. Well, this would be um, like writing k to the first over k to the 0.5. I know I can bring that up if I make it negative, so I would have k to the first, k to the negative 0.5. I can just, like our math proof showed us, I can add the exponents, and I get k to the 0.5. Or in this case now, I would have 3, 0.3 divided by 0.1 is equal to the square root of k. How do I solve it? I have to square both sides. Oops. So 9 is equal to k. Which is what that giant chart showed us. So it effectively allowed us to move all along this axis till we found that solved point for society. All right, we have knocked out the math of Solo. There's still more math, but it's